Our next speaker is uh, Amarda Shehu from George Mason University. Amarda, if you want to get your uh, slides set up. Yes, let me see if you can see them. Are they visible? Yes, they are visible and I can hear you fine. So the floor is yours. Perfect, thank you. So I am going to continue on what uh, Tandy started and I'm glad that she mentioned at some point going all the way down to a single gene because I'm gonna take us a little bit more down at the gene product and I'm going to talk about uh, macromolecular structure and how that impacts our ability to understand function. So I'm gonna uh, get us started by thinking about sort of an organizing principle of a lot of research in computational structural biology where we worry about how things look, uh, what forms, what shapes uh, they take. And I want to credit Sir Turing, who in a seminal paper in 1952, really posed the question of how the form of matter determine function. In biology, uh, we see an instantiation of this question uh, when we worry about how DNA tells us, gives us information about cellular function and how the gene products, the proteins, give us information about the biological function or the bi biological activities of proteins. But if we want to understand function, um, almost certainly we have to sort of produce another question, and that's the question of all right, if the journey to function goes through understanding and modeling form, how do I represent form and how much information and how much detail should I have in my representation of form? Um, unfortunately, um, another giant of science, Aristotle, is not that much help because he basically says that, all right, uh, try to work with, a, with an approximation of the truth if representing all the level of detail in form is uh, computationally infeasible, infeasible, and that is almost certainly the case in uh, biology. Um, so uh, trying to represent form, this is something that my group has thought about a lot over the years. And it's a challenging question because uh, two issues arise. One is representational detail and the other is scale. So when we talk about representational detail, we're basically saying, does just knowing the building units in a molecule, whether that's DNA or protein or RNA, is that enough to understand what that molecule performs in the cell? Or do I also need to worry about the arrangement of these units um, with regards to one another? Do I need to go to two dimensions or three dimensions? And then the matter of scale says, hold on, are you really simplifying the question? Can you get really that information from looking at one molecule in isolation? Or do you need to consider how the molecules come together? Do you need to go all the way up to the cell, the tissue and the organism? So these are challenging questions. And um, I, I will try to organize sort of our journey through trying to answer these questions or instantiations of these questions in sort of these three threads. I'll give an example where you can get a lot of information about function, you can infer function just by looking at the building units not going all the way to three dimensions. And then I'll say, okay, this is not enough when we go to proteins. So I will try to figure out how, do you, how could we represent structure now in order to get information about function. And then I'll add another complication and talk about molecules that are inherently uh, plastic, dynamic, that switch between structures in order to perform the biological activity. And we cannot ignore this if we want to understand their function or dysfunction specifically in pathologies that are due to, uh, to proteins. So uh, we've done a lot of work in this first thread, how to go from sequence to function. And I just want to give an example of how biological knowledge can get you to very powerful models. We have studied uh, many different, uh, what I would call recognition problems that ultimately end up being sort of classic classification problems. What I'm showing here in this figure is a promoter region. It used to be a very sort of um, uh, classic and very appealing problem for machine learning researchers to annotate, to identify uh, promoter regions in DNA. And you could say that uh, in 2012 up to 2014 that it was a subfield that was saturated because a lot of models had been put out there and they were pretty decent in their, um, in their performance, but uh, their performance had, had peaked. 
so we got interested in this question by a collaborator um, who used to be at, at Maryland College Park. And um, our first inclination in, in the lab was to really understand the biology, to understand that the reason that this particular region in DNA is a promoter that sort of starts that signaling that ends with transcription is because a specific protein, a core RNA polymerase, is able to identify the hidden signal in this region and to bind to it and then start a whole series of events. So we understood that function really encodes implicit constraints, even if we only consider a linear representation, basically only the basis um, and how they link up with one another in, in one dimension. We realized that this protein, because it's a three-dimensional object, when it comes and it binds a region and recognizes it as a promoter region, it's basically recognizing subsequences or motifs that are far away in, in sequence from one another. So it's imposing non-local or distal constraints and we wanted to capture them as features. So we had this inspiration that, okay, we can represent these biological signatures if we construct uh, complex features, uh, some of them, for instance, demanding the presence of two motifs uh, in different positions. We call this correlation of features, in addition to other, you know, the more useful, uh, the more common, I should say, features that everybody was putting together at the time, uh, mainly compositional and positional features. So our, um, our idea was to really have uh, sort of a representation of a promoter region in terms of a bag of biological signatures in it, uh, these features that would, that would be able to discriminate it from other non-promoter regions. So we would have a very interpretable answer to how is it that this sequence uh, encodes uh, being a promoter, encodes function. Uh, so we used a lot of ideas from uh, predicate logic, from grammar in order to uh, sort of build these richer representations of both local and non-local constraints. And we could really construct very, very complex, very rich features by Boolean combinations of our basic building blocks. Uh, we could have ands, ors, nots on top of um, sort of other compositions. Uh, we used our ideas from um, uh, how do you explore a high dimensional space in order to um, deal with uh, the possible issue of exponential explosion of your feature space by using genetic programming, sort of a biased uh, sampling of the feature space biased by a surrogate fitness function. And we were able basically to put together a full framework, which we call the effect framework. Um, I, I can't tell you now what all the letters stand for, but it was something about features and evolutionary computation at the time. And the framework framework really outperformed uh, many of the methods at the time. Uh, it had, um, it produced features with very high information gain. And more interestingly for us, it gave very interpretable features. If you see here on the right, you can see what the feature is and a biologist can, can read off it and say, okay, so it means either a motif at this or a motif at this and, and, and so on. Uh, we went and we scoured PubMed literature for the presence of the features that we had found in biological literature. And indeed, we found that many of our features features were known, they had been named by biologists, so we were able to replicate existing knowledge and sort of in a more tantalizing aspect, we were all able to also produce features that were not published in or, or documented in literature at the time. Um, and, and sort of this got us to thinking that, hey, maybe we were also advancing knowledge. But all these became because we were able to marry some pretty, I would say, standard uh, methods in machine learning with our information or our knowledge of, of, of what it means uh, to be functional of, of the underlying biology. We then use some of these ideas in order to sort of even make some improvements in machine learning um, in order to evolve features and kernels. Um, and as, as Tandy mentioned, um, nowadays there's also the sort of this, this drive to what would a, a deep neural network do. Um, I resisted it in the lab for some time because um, I'm always driven to understand the deeper uh, sort of the deeper biology and, and the sort of the deeper question, but I had students who were really itching to put together a deep neural network in order to, to drive at some of these same questions uh, when you were able, where, where you are able to infer function from sequence. So um, I had a student at the time who were, was able to put a, a rather simple, I would say, a deep neural network with convolutional layers and recurrent layers. Uh, the recurrent layers uh, would help us to handle arbitrary length uh, peptides in this case. 
So uh, we, um, we, we became, became interested in additional uh, recognition problems. And the specific one that I'm showing here is the problem of recognizing antimicrobial activity uh, from um, a given uh, peptide sequences, so very, very small proteins. So in these ones, we're not considering what form they take in three dimensions, just the sequence of amino acids uh, that um, that compose the peptide. And to our, uh, to my dismay, I should say, but to the happiness of my student who, uh, I mean, we then published this paper, uh, we found that the deep neural network really outperformed all the other machine learning uh, models that were published on antimicrobial activity recognition. But what we sacrificed was interpretability because we um, it could not very easily go and, you know, have this, this, this very explicit interpretable bag of the features of the biological signals to say, okay, here, this is what it means to be antimicrobial. So um, you, we could get the performance, but really not the, the deeper biological uh, reason for antimicrobial activity. Um, if we keep going at this question of how much you need in order to infer function, the answer really depends on the problem at hand. If you go to, uh, uh, to proteins, uh, for instance, here, almost certainly you will uh, clash, you will <laughs> against the wall of structure, of three-dimensional structure. And it's important because I'm gonna show you, so these, these red threads here are two three-dimensional structures, two different proteins. These proteins, if we consider, if we only compare their sequence of amino acids, the building units that compose them, they have very low identity. So a very small percentage of amino acids are identical. Uh, but they are functionally similar. Their activities are very similar. And you could see, you can see just from these pictures and recognize, oh, the structures look similar too. Yes, so it's very often the case in proteins that sequence is not enough. You need to consider the three-dimensional organization of the building units because that can tell you more information about function. So if I put it in terms of evolution, really function places more of a constraint on the three-dimensional structure of a protein rather than on its sequence. The sequence changes with much more frequency. So now the question becomes, if I'm looking at structure as the form from which to infer function, how do I represent structure? This is, uh, this is a challenge in question. And the key insight that we had at the time was, all right, maybe uh, I need to add some spatial information to the building blocks. My idea of motifs needs to change. It needs to, to consider three-dimensional uh, information. But we, we need really succinct representations. Um, they need to be informative to help us answer the problem at hand, but I shouldn't end up with these bloated representations that then you know, will, will make the problem infeasible. So um, we had some insight from biology that even though three-dimensional structures of proteins are very rich and very diverse, they seem to be using uh, sort of a limited uh, library of dictionary, if you want, of short spatial fragments. So when we consider space, we call those motifs fragments now. And so our insight was to, all right, go over known protein structures, compile the different fragments that we see in protein, in known protein structures, and then use these fragments in order to represent a, a protein structure. Um, we used analogies with text mining, basically looking at our protein structure as a document and looking at the fragments as the words, and then using uh, LDA, latent Dirac allocation, in order to obtain topics, distributions over the fragments, and end up with a much reduced, much lower dimensional topic-based representation. Uh, of protein structures. And we showed that this topic-based representation uh, was informative. It helped us to um, um, sort of do some inference tasks, predict superfamilies in this case, even in superfamilies that had a very high imbalance, very few protein structures known. And more interestingly, when we started to dig into what do these topics tell us, we found out that, all right, these topics, some of them were present in only few superfamilies, whereas others were present in, in a few more. So one thing I want to mention is that when you sometimes want to make analogies with other sort of subdomains in machine learning, um, other challenges pop up. For instance, in text mining, when you obtain topics, you can sort of look at the distribution of words and you can say, oh, this topic captures sports or this topic captures politics. But when it comes to proteins, you don't have, you know, that, that lexicon. You, you cannot explain this topic similarly. So you need to um, dig a little bit deeper and use other tools at your disposal in order to give meaning to, uh, to topics. Um, 
we, we had a little bit of detour along the way, I would say, when we started to think about function and how to get it from, from sequence or from structured data, we realized that uh, we could have a lot of data as uh, Tandy mentioned. So how do you do machine learning at scale, especially for when we were dealing with sequences uh, from DNA promoter versus non-promoter sequences, we had millions and more um, sequences. So we, we had a little bit of detour and, and uh, put together um, in the past few years, and uh, this was before, um, I think it was before XG Boost and ADA Boost, we put together what we called a parallel spatial boosting machine learner, where we used ideas on how to distribute uh, the training data uh, over toroidal grids and how to distribute the, the learning basically uh, to have many learners learn locally, but exchange samples uh, with neighboring learners and evolve the training data basically towards the most difficult instances that together uh, sort of patch that uh, decision boundary. And we were able to also publish some theoretical results and get more insight into why uh, PSBML performed as well as it did. Um, we, I'm, I'm not able to tell you uh, about a lot of other uh, problems that end up being how do I infer information from three dimensional structure, but in structural biology, they have sort of specific names. So I'm just mentioning them for people uh, that work in this subdomain model quality assessment, decoy selection. And in, and in this subdomain, we also um, did some work on manifold learning and more generally in, in representation learning via I, I want to say things such as um, autoencoders and variational autoencoders. So let me try to get to the part of the talk that is of more interest to me, the, the more uh, sort of recent uh, work in the lab, which considers uh, this additional complication that many macromolecules, uh, proteins, and even RNA, um, they're not frozen, they're not static, they are always um, oscillating, they're always fluctuating. So hopefully this, um, uh, this animation shows. On the top left here, I'm showing a sheet of um, um, cardiomyocytes. These are heart cells that are grown from a collaborator uh, at UPenn. Um, this was a very recent paper that came out uh, where you can see basically the heart beating. Um, and, and we could, uh, we could determine um, sort of abnormalities to the amplitude and the frequency of the heart beating. We could trace them all the way down to mutations in a specific protein um, that was uh, due to binding another one was sort of the main culprit for several uh, cardiomyopathies. On the uh, bottom right here, I'm showing to you a single molecule view. Uh, the bottom right is a, a very important signaling protein that signals um, uh, cells when to grow and when to stop growing. And the, what we have understood for a long time about this protein is that it sort of exchanges between two main structures, an on and an off structure. And in one of them, it's basically starting a cascade of signaling events that tells the cell, yeah, you can grow. And in the other, when it's off, it stops uh, the signaling cascade. So the, the cell uh, stops growing. And many mutations in this protein basically disrupt uh, this mechanism and show up in various uh, cancers. So uh, a key driver in the laboratory is not only to, to exploit form in order to, to answer questions about function or, or, or dysfunction, but really to go further and to exploit these dynamics, changes to form, to be very cognizant of that. And even though most of the work that I'm, I'm showing here today is specifically on, on biology, a lot of the ideas uh, pertain and allow us to answer, have allowed my lab to answer interesting questions about other complex modular dynamic systems such as networks and bridges and, and so on. So um, it, it's very satisfying to go from one domain to another. Um, so all these, all these structures between which proteins, let's say, uh, fluctuate or other molecules, they have to satisfy constraints. So it's a very interesting question to, um, to throw to students to say, okay, can you put together a generative model that can predict uh, basically the different forms, the different structures that satisfy certain constraints, functional constraints or energetic constraints. And, and to be able to um, answer specific sub-questions in structural biology, such as structure transitions, how does tell me what is the specific series of structures that takes my protein from on to off? I want to see the movie. I don't want to see just the beginning and the end. I want to see the frames in the middle. Or to go even further and say, look, I don't have much information about this protein, but can you tell me about its whole 
configuration space? Can you tell me about the structures that it accesses? I'm starting from scratch. And when you start from scratch, this is a problem known as protein tertiary structure prediction. We've done a lot of work uh, in this one via uh, classic stochastic search and optimization algorithms. And more recently, we are going in sort of the direction of variational autoencoders and um, adversarial networks. The reason I have highlighted them in blue is because they don't do as well as our uh, best uh, methods. Um, and you can, uh, you can sort of keep using ideas from um, um, sort of generative models in order to map, for instance, what is the landscape, what is the space of all small drug-like molecules. And here we've made actually some headways. It seems that um, uh, a deep learning uh, can capture, uh, can allow us to uh, really generate uh, sort of more credible distributions of small molecules than um, distributions of, of, of larger molecules, such as um, uh, proteins of a few hundred amino acids. So here, for instance, is a very um, a short summary. This is very recent work. Some of it appeared at KDD this year and uh, at ACMBCB uh, in a few weeks. And this one basically is showing the schematic of the graph generative uh, network that we put together, which was able to generate small molecules that you see here on the top left, the numbers below show you uh, how much drug-like they are. This is a measure that you can actually, this is something a metric you can measure. Um, and so here is basically a, a, a snapshot of the different molecules that this um, network when trained um, over available data was able to, uh, uh, to generate. Uh, these networks don't do so well when you now um, want to expand beyond, you know, a few atoms to thousands of atoms and capture these spaghetti-like uh, colorful structures that you see here. Um, uh, here we have made better headway uh, with other stochastic search um, algorithms, but even these ones have to use information in order to map, you know, the rich landscape, such as this terrain that I'm showing to you here. This is an illustration uh, that captures all the all the different structures of a protein. Uh, so we had a, a little bit of insight by understanding a little bit more about the energy landscape view of protein folding and protein binding um, by realizing that when a protein, even if it, uh, when we only know information about it in terms of it switching between two structures, that switching is actually a pathway in a terrain, in a landscape. Every point in the landscape is a different structure. And the height of the terrain tells us about the energetic, um, the ability of the protein to access, how hard it is to access uh, that structure. So how long, how much time will it take the protein to access that structure at equilibrium, at physiological conditions. Uh, so what we were able to do um, was using known um, structures, for instance, uh, even of different versions of the of a protein, we were able to see that these were points in a landscape, and we could exploit this information in order to map to find the, the variables uh, to sort of map the manifold and and to conduct the search in the right space. Um, here is, I'm not going to go in detail over this method, but it is not a, a deep learning. Um, uh, it is actually an evolutionary uh, algorithm uh, that um, takes the sort of the variables that you have found, the variables of intrinsic motion among known protein structures, and populates the space with even more structures in order to obtain hundreds of thousands of them. Each single point in this picture corresponds to a structure, average use state over the two principal components. The the black dots are known experimental structures and all the other ones are new structures generated by the algorithm. So I have really a global view of the landscape of, of uh, this is a specific protein known as calmodulin. And I can even uh, map, uh, I, can, I, put, uh, I can put a graph representation of this landscape and answer very interesting questions about, oh, how much time does it take to switch from one dot to another dot, from one structure to another structure. And here on the right, I'm showing to you sort of a schematic representation of all the different pathways that we were able to extract from the landscape of how calmodulin switches between known experimental structures. And this view was very interesting because it allowed us to reconcile seemingly contradictory wet laboratory findings um, and tell us here is how calmodulin is able to shed calcium and bind protein, either first uh, by doing it in a serial manner or in a gradual manner. Uh, so there we were able to, to reconcile what used to be sort of two different views in biological literature at the time. Here is the first ever landscape, the first ever view of the structure space of RAS, that protein that I was telling you is so important uh, in many uh, human cancers. We were able to take
take all known um, biological literature and sort of map it on our landscape and figure out, oh, this is where this um, allosteric switch happens because we had for the first time a global view of the structure space accessible by RAS. And more interestingly, we were able to use the same method to map the space, not only of the healthy form of RAS, but also of other variants. Uh, so uh, forms of RAS where there have been mutations. And we were able to see, for instance, that the space, the landscape of oncogenic variants of RAS, they were very similar. They had an interesting mechanism of making the off-state uh, more and more inaccessible, whereas other forms of RAS that were causing disorders, but not really oncogenic, had a very different mechanism. We pursued this even further, and we extracted descriptors from these landscapes, and we were able uh, then in, in training over known biochemical measurements to tell in great detail um, where um, what specific uh, mechanisms were impacted by the mutation. So this was sort of our first uh, very successful story of predicting the phenotypical impact of mutations through uh, an algorithm that was able to generate more structures and then to infer the, the landscape and, and extract important information from it. So um, I hope to have made a little bit of sense. This was work that has been funded in part by NSF and many other uh, private awards. And the work that I highlighted is done with several collaborators at my institutions and in other places. You can find more information at our website, or you can email me directly with any questions or follow up. Thank you. Kevin, you are muted. <laughs> Thank you, Amarda, uh, for the presentation. We have a couple of minutes. Uh, I want to get to two questions, if you can answer them concisely. The first one I think might be short. Is uh, The question is, are the structures that you are learning smooth functions, or do they have considerable non-smoothness? It seems to be the latter from the graphics. When you say the latter part, so the, the structures are not functions. The structures that we have, uh, so now it depends how you represent them, but um, in, in sort of the most uh, straightforward representation, the structures we have specify the Cartesian coordinates of each of the atoms that are bonded to one another and that are the units of, of the structures. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the question stems to the structural transitions that you were modeling. Ah, the structural transitions. No, the structural transitions are not function. Again, so I, I made this analogy with movies. They are a series of structures that tell us a sort of the order in which um, you have to go through in order to go from, uh, say, your source A to your destination B. Thanks. Okay, and then the one additional question is, I'm going to just read this one verbatim. Could you expand more on how, how you assign meaning from topics as defined by LDA? I've experienced it being difficult with text analysis, but curious how that translates. Yes, that is a, uh, we were having a hard time. Let me try to go to that slide. I apologize for the nausea this may be causing. Um, so I said in passing that it's generally hard because you, you don't know, it's not that I can, I can look at the distribution of fragments and say, oh, you know, the word sports appears uh, many more times over others. So I'm gonna call this mainly a, a, a sports. Uh, this document covers the, mainly the topic sports. So in here, what we did is, what I'm showing is really a heat map. So I'm showing basically for, let's say for a specific topic. And again, you see, I have not labeled the topics. They would be here uh, on the columns. Let's say topic from one to A, they are named List because we don't have names from them. But every each topic is a distribution of fragments. So we would see basically where is the topic more prevalent across the different superfamilies. And here, this is basically heat map. In red means more prevalent. In blue um, is less prevalent. I don't think the contrast is showing very well. It's coming across very well. Uh, but this is a way that we could sort of infer meaning to topics and say, ah, you know, topic one predominantly um, is more prevalent on the PILU binding uh, superfamily and the EF head superfamily, and not so much on the others. It's sort of an attempt to interpret the topics. It's not, I would say, the uh, the end all be all, but it is um, sort of a reasonable way of trying to understand um, or to link a topic if you want to to function. All right. Thank you very much again, Amarda.